Hey everybody, uh, this is Jake Wynn from Penn Civil War, kicking off another one of our uh, live streams that we've been doing uh, during the COVID-19 shutdown. Uh, tonight, we're really excited bringing you a program that is going to uh, uh, cover the events of April 9th, 1865. Uh, we are commemorating the 155th anniversary of the Confederate surrender at Appomattox. Uh, and we thought it would be the perfect occasion for another one of our live streams. So we are uh, gathered here, the four of us um, contributors and, and founding founding contributors, I guess that we could call um, ourselves, of, of the Pennsylvania and the Civil War Project, um, which is a blog dedicated to telling the story of Pennsylvania in the American Civil War, um, both on the battlefield and on the home front and all of the stories in between. Uh, we are joined tonight um, by Beth Parnitza from Appomattox Courthouse. We're really excited about that. And we're also joined by Sophie the dog. Um, hi, Sophie. Sophie, look. Sophie. Look. Oh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're really here. excited. We're really excited for uh, for tonight's uh, kind of conversation. Um, this is meant to be a, uh, you know, not only kind of a history lesson, um, but also a time for uh, those interested in the Civil War to kind of gather. Um, to come in and join in the conversation. So encourage you all at watching out there to, uh, you know, let us know you're here, uh, where you're watching from, uh, if you have any questions as we're going through um, our, our evening's program. Uh, what we're gonna do is kind of a, um, some brief presentations. Um, we're gonna learn a little bit about Appomattox, what happened there on this day in history. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Pennsylvania side of the story and, and kind of reaction to uh, the events at Appomattox as well as um, from some soldiers who were there um, in the vicinity of Appomattox uh, on April 9th, 1865. Uh, and then we will kind of converse about it and, and take your questions. And we're really excited about these programs and, and being able to talk to all of you. Um, I don't know about the rest of you guys, um, but uh, you know, social distancing has been hard. It's been hard to be away from other people. Um, so this is like a nice way of being able to have some human interaction um, with people outside your households um, and to talk about what we're what we're all passionate about about civil war history so um, let's go around um, introduce ourselves um, and uh, yeah say hi to everyone start right. with rich oh, good. oh hey guys uh, my name is rich condon i uh, am a one of the founders and contributors to pennsylvania and the civil war uh, but i also uh, run an organization called civil war pittsburgh which is based out of you guessed it, Western Pennsylvania. So uh, Civil War Pittsburgh, just like Pennsylvania in the Civil War, uh, we promote stories from the local area as well as preservation of significant sites to uh, Pennsylvania's role in the American Civil War. Um, you can find Civil War Pittsburgh at civilwarpittsburgh.com as well as Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So. Twitter. Twitter. All right. Oh, my, my next. Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kendrick Gibbs, um, one of the found, co founders and uh, contributors to Pennsylvania in the Civil War. Um, I also run a page called Keystoners in Union Blue, uh, which is kind of a, a side, side uh, gig for me, uh, just kind of talking about um, the soldier experience during the war. Uh, I usually like to get, talk about some personal stories, especially like uh, family stories on there. Um, in places that I've visited um, recently. Um, I'm also joined here by my, my counterpart, Sophie. Uh, she's kind of like my Sally the dog, like the 11th PA um, uh, mascot. So she'll be jumping in and out of the frame, I'm sure, for the next hour. All right, uh, my name is Cody Aish, and in addition to Pennsylvania and the Civil War, I run a Facebook page called Cody Aish Writer and Historian. My uh, kind of main emphasis is on Civil War memory, legacy, kind of the veteran experience, monument dedications, things of that nature. I'm also a co-host on the Battles and Banter Military History Podcast with Avery Lentz and Tony Brown. And uh, my day job is at Seminary Ridge Museum in Gettysburg. Uh, I work as, as this visitor services coordinator there. And so a lot of my emphasis is as well on Gettysburg, just because it's what I'm typically surrounded by on a daily basis. And I'm Jake Wynn. I am a historian at the 
uh, National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland and the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum. Um, been writing for uh, Penn Civil War since our start in uh, July of 2019. And I also write um, on the history of Northeastern Pennsylvania um, and the, the coal region there, um, the history and culture there at winninghistory.com. Um, I'm really excited tonight uh, because we are joined by a special guest um, that we were very excited to, uh, to, so excited about that both myself and Rich both simultaneously messaged Beth because um, we were so excited about the idea of having her on the show. So Beth Parnitza is the chief educator at Appomattox Courthouse uh, Historical Park. So um, Beth, welcome to uh, our second uh, weekly uh, Penn Civil War Facebook Live. Thanks, Jake. Um, and thanks, Rich, for simultaneously messaging me. Um, it made me feel very popular in a time when, you know, social interaction isn't really happening that much. And I'm like, yes, everybody's texting all at once um, and wants me to be on the show, which means also that um, my mathematics anniversary went from being a very exciting day full of programs and play to being me working on my computer at home. So this is great because I actually have the opportunity to talk about Appomattox and basically give a presentation. So I'm really excited to be here. So thanks. Excellent. So we're, we're giving, uh, you know, we're all kind of public historians in one way or another. Um, so we're all having an opportunity to kind of do what we do uh, with out being able to actually go out into the world and, and talk about these topics. So um, thank you so much for, uh, for Beth uh, being here. Um, and that's who we're gonna start with tonight. So um, we wanted to kind of give a kind of historical overview. I did a very poor job of that last week, um, describing the fall of Richmond um, and the, the events surrounding that. So we decided to go and get someone who actually knows what they're talking about um, and to bring in Beth. So uh, Beth, without further ado, Tell us, what happened at Appomattox? <laughs> well, you know, the, the beautiful thing, one of the things I love most about whenever someone says, what happened at Appomattox? You know, um, we're historians, so our favorite thing is context. And the first thing that all of us at Appomattox do when you say, what happened here? It's like, well, pause for just a minute. We got to back it all the way up. Um, and most of us back it all the way up to March of 1864, don't worry, this won't take all day. Um, when Ulysses S. Grant takes command of all the federal forces. And um, of course, that spring, spring of 1864, launches the Overland Campaign, basically back to Lee, um, up against Richmond and down into the siege of Petersburg for 10 months. So 10 months of trench warfare, small engagements. Um, and by the spring of 1865, part of what I appreciate, so I came to Appomattox after a career um, at Frederick Southern Pennsylvania National Military Park. So we talked overland campaign. And by the spring of 1865, one of the most interesting parts is taking a look at the armies because they look totally different. So between um, a few months in the overland campaign and 10 months of trench warfare in Petersburg, we have two armies that barely look like what they did um, a year before, let alone if you, you know, if your main reference point is Gettysburg, say, these, play, these people are totally unrecognizable by now. So both armies are worn down, have had a lot of change both in command and even morale, mentality, um, while they're, they're living around Petersburg. And things start to get um, rather desperate, I would say, for Robert E. Lee, particularly in late March and early April. There's already been some signs, both politically, militarily, and even socially, that things are wearing thin for the Confederacy, that there isn't a lot of hope left for the cause, and yet you still have a lot of people who believe in it very strongly. Um, Robert E. Lee is, is surviving with about 60,000 men um, based on the rail lines coming into Petersburg, which means that one of Grant's goals um, come spring is, and as he'd been working on for months to try to cut off those rail supply lines. Um, on April 1st, you have the really the beginning of what we see as the Appomattox campaign, the fall of Richmond, um, when federal forces attack Confederate lines at Five Forks um, outside of Petersburg. When they do that, they're able to capture about 2,000 Confederates, threaten the South Side Railroad, um, and it's just it's a major turning point in that campaign because Lee is starting to see, um, I think, the writing on the wall. The next day, April 2nd, you have a major breakthrough in the lines at Petersburg. 
and it becomes apparent that neither Richmond nor Petersburg is tenable anymore. Um, Lee immediately begins to evacuate his lines, evacuates Richmond. They burn the supplies and, and sadly many Confederate records um, in Richmond as Lee's army begins its retreat westward. Um, the idea here, of course, is that if he can continue to move west, he can then move south and join up with Joe Johnston's forces in North Carolina. Um, that obviously isn't going to happen because of what transpires over the next couple of days. As soon as Lee evacuates the lines, Grant is right on his heels. So even though there are some federal forces that you know, march into Richmond that start to put out the fires that deal with all of those, um, basically the aftermath of that, the bulk of Grant's armies are going to start moving west in, in hot pursuit of um, Lee's forces. So Lee's marching west. Um, this all helps to have a bit of a map and maybe I should have brought one. Um, but if, if you're able to, you know, consult- I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm, on, the, I'm on the case. Uh, what, are, what, are you, what are you looking for, Excellent. Beth? Uh, even if you just have a broad map that shows all those arrows moving west. Okay, I'm, I'm on it, I'm on the case. Say, awesome, I was gonna say, you know, on April 4th, the Confederates make it to Amelia Courthouse, which doesn't mean much if you can't see where Amelia Courthouse is. Surprisingly, it's not a bustling metropolis even today and no one knows where it is. Um, but it is, and we'll, maybe Jake will be able to quickly come up with a map for us. Um, but in the meantime, uh, Lee is leaving, evacuating all of his lines and Amelia Courthouse becomes a bit of a rallying point. Um, so he's hoping while he, when he gets there to be able to resupply a bit, the supplies are not there, but he still needs to concentrate his army. So he sends the men that are there out to forage to try to get more supplies. Um, they come back mostly empty handed but he knows that his army needs to keep moving. Oh man, there's a map. Okay. Oh, how's that? That works perfectly. Yeah, so you see um, you see the marker for Amelia Courthouse there. You see the different wings and that's, that's really the critical moment here. You see the different wings of Lee's army starting to come back together in one place at Amelia Courthouse. Um, they arrived there April 4th and they're moving again by April 5th as you see the date on there. Um, they start to head um, further west. They would have liked, Lee would have liked to have turned south at Jetersville, but because he delayed at Amelia Courthouse, instead um, the army just has to keep moving west to try to find another point at which they can turn south. Um, so they're headed toward Farmville, and if you've ever been to Appomattox, you know that we have two major landmarks here, because Rich was asking earlier, what's around Appomattox? Not much, um, but Farmville is one of them. Um, Farmville and Lynchburg and Appomattox is situated right in between them. So the army is now heading toward Farmville, which looks like um, potentially its next opportunity. Um, but you'll see on their way toward Farmville, you see a, a place called Sailor's Creek. And on this lovely map, it says Sailor's Creek, April 6th. And that is our next really major turning point. Um, the two armies will clash there. Um, it's really almost three battles in one at Sailor's Creek. And um, it's a huge federal victory. Um, it really nearly destroys Lee's army. Um, when he actually arrives on the field and sees what's happening, he actually sort of questions whether the army itself is being dissolved in the process. He loses Corps Commander Dick Yule and he loses his own son, uh, Custis, both of whom are captured at Sailor's Creek, um, along with almost 8,000 men. So this is a huge blow to Lee's army. Now Lee started this campaign with about 60,000 men and he just keeps losing men as he goes along. Either men who straggle out of the, the campaign or who were captured at small engagements along the way um, or who were just sort of nipped up from the back of the army um, if they can't keep up. So the army gets a pretty strong blow at Sailor's Creek. Lee picks up and keeps moving west um, as best he can. They try to burn um, one of the other nice landmarks of the area, the High Bridge, the remarkable, I'm sure most of you uh, watching have seen a picture of the High Bridge. It is exactly as described. It's a really high bridge at State Park today. You can go and visit. Um, it looks really spindly. If you see the wartime pictures of it, it's just terrifying, especially mm -hmm. if you have any fear of heights. Um, so they, they've crossed the High Bridge, they try to burn it, but they forget about a low wagon bridge. So the Union Army is still able to pursue um, and you can see these blue lines. Part of what I love the most about um, this map or any map is that you see all the, the red lines trying to converge 
at Amelia Courthouse. And then you see all the blue lines just continuing to kind of wag their way around. And that's because um, Grant has not only has men in pursuit, but he is also trying to get around to the other side of Lee to cut him off. So he doesn't just want to chase Lee for all time. He wants to be able to actually get in front of him and cut him off. So the Confederates continue to move west. You see Farmville on the map. You see they're, they're reaching that area around April 7th. Um, you see another small uh, engagement at Cumberland Church. They keep moving west. Um, at this point, on April 7th, that we have one of the other kind of key markers. So it's important to think, you know, we think about this as a pursuit, as, a, as an intense military campaign, but this is also uh, an opportunity to be somewhat political and to be strategic. So you also see um, in the exchanges of notes between Lee and Grant, something really interesting happening. Um, Grant sends a note to Lee on April 7th, because especially after Sailor's Creek, I think everyone is seeing, you know, this campaign is not going well for Lee. And Grant realizes it, he sends a note, and part of his note is saying to prevent the further effusion of blood, but part of it is in a way trying to shift blame. So instead of saying, hey, I don't, you know, if this campaign keeps going, it's not on me, Robert E. Lee, it's on you, because I'm asking if you would want to talk about surrender. Um, Lee refuses because he says it's really not to that point yet. But then he ends by saying, but what would be your terms if I did surrender? Um, which shows that Lee is also starting to see that things are, are getting desperate. Um, April 8th, Lee is again continuing west. If you take a look west, you know, you're following these railroad lines on the map here, you see Appomattox Station. Now, Appomattox Station is about three miles from Appomattox proper. Um, they built the, the railroad station just a little ways away from the courthouse. Um, but Lee is hoping to resupply when he gets to Appomattox Station. But federal cavalry it comes in and you have a really interesting clash there that's mostly cavalry against Confederate artillery. It's really bizarre. Um, but in the end, federal cavalry is able to capture the trains, captures a lot of artillery and scatters the rest. So it is not a great resupply and move south moment for Lee. Instead, he's able to come in and finds, you know, again, the supplies are captured, his artillery either captured or mostly gone. He holds a final council of war that night. And the next morning, attempts to break out of Appomattox Courthouse. So he finds um, that, you know, he's been pursued by one army. He knows the cavalry is on the other side of him, but this is his last chance to try to break out because he now has federal forces on two sides of him. He launches an infantry attack on the morning of April 9th. But it's unsuccessful. Well, it's initially successful. He breaks through the lines of cavalry and then infantry marches up behind. Um, and this shows that Lee has been surrounded um, on all sides, which makes him much more willing to talk about the surrender. So he had sent another note to Grant, um, basically saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that it's desperate enough time to talk surrender, um, but I want to talk peace. That was the initial note, um, or the initial response to Grant's note. Um, Grant says, you know, I can't talk peace. The only thing I can talk about is the surrender. My only concern is that Confederate forces would lay down their weapons and agree not to take up arms against the federal government again. Um, and uh, Lee says again, I don't think it's time yet. But on the morning of April 9th, when he sees infantry on both sides uh, of him, he realizes there's no way out. And he finally sends that last letter to Grant asking to meet and discuss surrender. So that brings us to um, the main event, if you will, on April 9th, um, in which you see the actual surrender of the Army of Northern Virginia. And I think it's really interesting. A lot of visitors ask, they don't know, you know, why Appomattox, it's in the middle of nowhere. Why would it happen here? That's a nice little town, but what's, what's the big deal? And it's really, this is finally the place the Union Army caught up with Lee and surrounded him on, on both sides, or really all sides. Um, so they, Lee asks for this conference. They meet in the home of Wilmer McLean in the front parlor of his house. Um, they talk for about an hour and a half or so um, in which they discuss pleasantries at first. I can't imagine making small talk with either Robert E. Lee or Ulysses S. Grant, but they did it with each other for at least a half an hour um, until Lee finally is the one who brings it back to, I came to talk about the surrender. 
So Grant, they talk about the terms, Grant offers basically the same terms that he had discussed in the letter, which is that as long as the Confederates lay down their arms, agree to go home and not take up arms against uh, the federal government again, everyone can go home. Lee agrees uh, with the only the small caveat asking that his um, personal or that his men who claim to own their own horses can take that as personal property back with them. Grant agrees. Um, again, it's, it's a surprisingly sort of modest conversation, really. Um, very businesslike, and they come to terms pretty quickly. Ely Parker, who's actually a Seneca Indian, writes out the, the um, terms in, in a proper ink copy because he has the best handwriting of everybody present. And Lee signs his agreement, Grant signs his terms, and that basically wraps up the meeting. Um, and with such a very small, short conversation, you see the proposed reunion of the entire country. And you see, especially for enslaved people in Appomattox, but also in other places across the South, you see this celebrated later as Emancipation Day, because no matter what the Emancipation Proclamation said, if you're in Confederate held territory far away from Union armies, it doesn't mean anything until something like this happens. Finally, the Confederate army is no longer operating in your area. The Union Army is. Emancipation comes at least to that part of Virginia on April 9th. So with a few strokes of the pen, you see some really momentous um, occasions happening all 155 years ago today. That's an amazing job of uh, summarizing. That was a great summarization. A week of just Thanks. <laughs> incredibly momentous events into uh, a, a short time frame. So thank you so much, Beth. Um, we do have a, a question um, that you might be able to 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 help us with. Um, I don't know this off the off the top of my head, um, uh, but how many casualties in in this particular campaign? Um, yeah, that's a, a really great question. Um, I think one of the key things to keep in mind here is that you have these, basically the armies, so casualties, of course, usually involves killed, wounded, and captured. And in this case, a lot of the, a lot of the numbers are going to be captured, or in terms of the federal army, some of them being branched off, you know, taking care of other things. Um, so you have the Confederate army starting off, leaving Petersburg with 60,000 men. Lee surrenders, um, and we know this because Lee himself reports having considerably fewer men that he actually surrenders. But we know this because we're the federal government and we do documentation for everything. Just ask me about my job sometimes. <laughs> um, and we have paperwork. Uh, we, there was a list of paroles because every Confederate soldier got a parole pass slip. Um, so about 28,000 paroles were issued. So Lee goes from 60,000 to 28,000 maybe 30,000 pops. Um, so his army's cut in half by the time he gets to Appomattox. Um, for the Federals, um, now you've got combined forces here. You've got Meade's Army of the Potomac, you have Ord's Army of the James, and you have Sheridan's Army of the Shenandoah, lots of cavalry, um, all together in one. And that's about 120,000 men starting off from Petersburg. By the time they are surrounding Lee, so the forces that actually bring him to bear, it's about 65,000. Now, again, through most of these small engagements, the Confederates are the ones taking the really heavy casualties. And in those, it's still a lot of captured. So don't think that there's this great slaughter of armies in the course of this campaign. It's a lot of folks being left behind along the way. But if you wanna know like size of armies beginning to end of the campaign, because it's only a matter of days, really. Um, another another good question here. Um, where did Lee go after signing the surrender documents? So Lee goes back first to his army, where he issues his very famous last orders, um, which I, I do have a copy and I can read if anyone really wants to, but then I will insist on reading grants as well. Um, he writes his final farewell order to his men. Um, you know, they wrap up whatever they need to do. And then Lee actually goes back to Richmond where his wife was afterward. Gotcha, all right. Um, well, I wanna give uh, a shout out quickly to some of the folks who have been watching with us, which we have uh, been averaging around 40 uh, to 50 people watching, which is great. Um, so shout out to Eric Mink watching, 
says this is a nice collection of historians tonight. Uh, I would agree. Um, got James Joseph, Paul Orange, uh, Greg Hinsley. Hi, Greg. Watching from my kitchen. Hello. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brad Painter. Um, who else do we have here? Uh, Brad is my fiance's uh, cousin. So that's Excellent. Hi, Brad. Um, we got Antonio Fritz, age 11, from Somerset, PA. Hi, Antonio. Got uh, uh, bringing, bringing in the, uh, the youth tonight. Excellent. Uh, Casey DeHaven, watching from Manassas. Um, we've got uh, Mandy Gibbs from York, PA. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> Kendrick's mom. Thanks for watching. Uh, we got Jeff from Clinton, Mississippi. Hi, Jeff. Bringing in the Southern Wing. Uh, Chris from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, we got a hi, Sophie, from uh, Kendrick's mom. Yeah. <laughs> um, some other folks watching, uh, Joe LaFleur, uh, Vernal Blankenship Winnie, um, Steve Fan. Hi, Steve. Uh, John Tracy, Matt Locke. Thank you all so much for watching. Yeah. Really, really appreciate this. I want to give a shout out to Lee White as well. I just saw Lee actually shared our video in a, a few different forums. So thank you, Lee. Thanks. Hope you're doing well down there in Georgia. And, and uh, uh, Joe, Joe LaFleur um, says that he misses Beth's wi wisdom in the wilderness. Uh, Fredericksburg volunteer there. Um, <laughs> Joe, thanks, thanks, Joe. For, thanks for watching. Um, so if you are enjoying the, enjoying the feed tonight, enjoying the stream, um, you know, uh, give us a like, uh, hit that like button, uh, share. Um, that helps us to, to get more people here. Um, and that means that more people get to join in the conversation and, and enjoy some history, even though we might be trapped at home, uh, we can still have these kinds of conversations. I don't know about the rest of you. I would assume this is the case. Would much rather be on the battlefield talking about these topics as opposed to being locked away in our, in our houses and in, in my case, a uh, quiet museum. Um, so do any of uh, my fellow contributors here have any questions for, or comments for, for Beth? If not, that's fine <laughs> too. Um, I, got a, I got a question for Beth. Um, yeah. So uh, Beth, as, we, as you probably gathered from our, our pre-discussion uh, before we went live, I live in Richmond. And um, since uh, we're not under as strict uh, restrictions as our, our PA uh, counterparts here, um, I, I actually have been taking the liberty of taking drives on the weekends. And I went out to Amelia Courthouse uh, two Sundays ago. Do you know, do you know where they met uh, or where they, the rally, that rally point was in Amelia Courthouse? Was it on the courthouse green or was it close, like outside of the, of the little town at another location? You know, that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure. I imagine somewhere between the courthouse and the train stop. Um, okay. Amelia Courthouse was not a big place last I visited a year ago it's or not, so. It's, it's not very big, no. <laughs> and I'm guessing that the, the thousands of troops would have found each other at some point or another, but I'm not sure if there was a, a specified um, spot except for Amelia Courthouse. I'd have to go back and check the, the records to see. Um, but yeah, my guess would be, I mean, they're looking for supplies from the railroad if possible, if they're there. Um, and then, yeah, just rallying on, on Maddox Amelia Courthouse to see. But uh, also as a quick plug, if you are getting out and driving and walking, so Appomattox Courthouse is one of the parks that is closed. Um, but if you're doing your, your daily constitutional walk, you can walk through the park. Just be yourself. Oh, really? Oh, that's good to know. I was thinking about going out there, but I wasn't sure if we were allowed to do that. Yeah, um, it's at your own risk because the park's closed. Um, and yeah. please, please social distance. Um, but yes, if you want to walk for exercise and enjoyment you can come to the park and it's beautiful Excellent. right now yes yeah I got very the, great drive out 360 and 460 for sure uh, yeah. the u.s routes around that area for anybody who's not familiar well and for richmond folks especially the civil war trails um lee's lee's last retreat mm -hmm. lee's retreat yeah, that route that's it. Lee's retreat. yeah um lee's retreat that takes you through each step of this campaign it's a really tremendous civil war trails um brochure and guide so shout out to drew gruber even though I don't yeah think shout out to drew we uh we we talked quite a bit about civil war trails last week um on our else um check they them out those in the event as well yes and thank you to uh to drew for sharing the event uh for us 
Um, so I want to do a pivot now. Um, we talked kind of generally about uh, the events of, of April of 1865 leading up to Appomattox and the Confederate surrender. Uh, so I want to dive in now to the Pennsylvania side of the story. We are a Pennsylvania dedicated um, blog uh, that focuses on that aspect of the Civil War. Uh, so we're going to start off with, uh, with Rich. What do you have uh, for us this evening? So uh, I actually chose this evening to talk about the 155th Pennsylvania Infantry, uh, which is heavily recruited around Western Pennsylvania, um, specifically Allegheny County. So around the Pittsburgh area, and you have a lot of guys from around Clarion as well as uh, Armstrong County as well. For any of you who are from the Western Pennsylvania area, you know what I'm talking about. Um, the 155th Pennsylvania is going to see uh, a bit of action at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th. Um, they're going to arrive on the scene around uh, in the evening on April 8th. And in the morning on April 9th, uh, they're going to be actually called uh, into action in a skirmish line. So uh, Beth talked earlier about the, um, about the cavalry facing off against Confederates at Appomattox and that cavalry kind of breaking off and the Confederates meeting uh, federal infantry resistance. The 155th Pennsylvania is, is a part of that resistance. Uh, a lot of the guys actually talk about being called up the morning of April 9th into a skirmish line and pushing through federal cavalry into the Confederates um, and pushing them back with ease, as some of the guys said. Um, there's actually, there's, I have a couple accounts for you here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try not to go too long, but I have this handy dandy book right here. This is the Company K History of the 150th Pennsylvania. Yes, it's an original copy and it's really fragile. But anyway, this book uh, has some really great accounts. Uh, one in particular uh, is actually from a guy named Corporal George H. Cleaver. And uh, Cleaver actually talks about pushing through uh, toward the Confederate line and the Confederates back, he said about a mile or so. Uh, before they end up in the town of Appomattox Courthouse. And he mentions that him and two other gentlemen uh, chased a group of Confederates into the town and uh, actually capturing these Confederates on their own. He mentions, let me see here. Um, he said, I, I heard, I'm sorry. <laughs> I ran up to the crowd and jerked down their flag. One of their captains ordered them to shoot me. A corporal with the colors cocked his gun and put it to my breast. I let go the flag and took hold of his gun and pushed it to the side. Why he didn't shoot me, I don't know. But about that time, a cavalryman came along and he took the flag. I'm not certain about the number of prisoners we took, but I think it was 16 officers and 35 privates. Um, I did a little bit of background research on that and apparently they captured a little bit over 100 actually. Um, so that's just one story from the 155th Pennsylvania. Um, there's another one though that I wanna share with you uh, from Lieutenant David Porter. Um, sorry, Lieutenant David Porter Marshall of Company K. And let's see here. Uh, Porter actually wrote home on the 10th of April and he wrote home to his wife and he just gave a, a brief description of what had happened the day before and kind of what he's doing the day after. Uh, he says, my dear wife, here I'm writing on rebel paper and sitting on the chest that formerly contained the PO at this place with about 30,000 rebels lying in sight. Before this reaches you and perhaps even now, you've heard the glorious news. Such, an, such a sight I never witnessed as I have here in the last 30 hours. And it is not likely that, I'll sh that I shall ever see another like it. In 12 days from the time we started on this campaign, we have killed, wounded, and captured, as nearly as I can tell, 80,000 men of the rebel army. And the last 30,000 of them are lying here prostrate at the feet of our victorious army. I have suffered from hunger, thirst, heat, cold, wet, fatigue, and a hundred other ways to say nothing of the battles and dangers I have come through. But I feel now that I am compensated for all. We all consider the war ended or as good as ended, and the 155th can claim the honor of last driving the rebels, or as General Bartlett, our division commander and formerly our brigade commander says, that 
200 men of his brigade brought them to terms. And as there were none of our brigade or division engaged, but our regiment, we claim all the honor. There were two men wounded in the regiment, but none in Company K. So <clears throat> I just want to show you real quick. Uh, this is the guy who had written the letter. I just learned how to do a screen share. <laughs> Hold on one second. OK. There we go. That is Lieutenant David Porter Marshall, the tallest man in the 155th Pennsylvania. He stood at six foot nine inches. Wow. He's an easy <laughs> party. Yeah. <laughs> so soak that in. Uh, they actually had to, uh, when they were issued their Zouav uniforms in the early part of 1864, they had to give him two different Zouav uniforms so he could custom make his own. And it was, just, it was described by several men as a grotesque looking uniform. Um, but anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm really disappointed. I said this before we started to the group, but I'm really sad that Rich isn't wearing a fez right now. <laughs> Aren't we, we all we like doctor one on my head or something? Um, Probably could. I'm not that technically gifted. <laughs> it, it doesn't end there, though. Um, Marshall mentioned in the account that there's two men in the regiment that are wounded. Uh, one of them is claimed by the 155th Pennsylvania Regimental History to be the last person killed in the, on the Eastern Front uh, in the American Civil War. Um, he was one of, of several, from what I gather. Uh, it was a really young man uh, named William Montgomery. I'm going to screen share his image here with you in a second. So this is young William Montgomery you see here. Uh, in the regimental history, it says he's 15 years old, but records really point to uh, somewhere about 18, 19 years old. Uh, Montgomery is uh, mortally wounded during the advance of the 155th. Um, on the morning of uh, April 9th, 1865. Uh, he's gonna be hit by a piece of artillery and uh, he actually passes away, I believe it's April 29th, 1865. So uh, he's bedridden for a few weeks before he passes away. Um, but he's one of the last casualties uh, on the Eastern Front in the American Civil War. Uh, he's buried in Poplar Grove Cemetery near Petersburg now. Um, so that is the, the, the 155th is going to be among, I believe it was, Beth, was it eight regiments that accepted the flags of uh, the surrendering, surrendering army? You know, I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> that, I, I didn't have time to, <laughs> to, to uh, cross check, but I believe it was the 155th, the 118th Pennsylvania, 91st Pennsylvania. There's two Michigan regiments, and uh, everyone loves the 20th Maine. They're there as well. Yeah, yeah Chamberlain uh, gets all the glory. Cheers for all the Pennsylvania regiments who were there and down with the 20th Maine, which I know will not make me popular, but I am not a fan of the 20th. Well, we I mean, lost I'm miles. not a fan of the hype around the 20th Maine. Yeah, um, like, just because of Chamberlain doesn't mean you should, like, dismiss the entire 20th Maine. And let's all and, say, what's the real problem with the 20th Maine? Right. I mean, I don't have a problem with them. I just wrote a blog post about them. Uh, I would say <laughs> I, I have a problem with the uh, the hype around the 20th Maine at Little Round Top, and we forget about all of the other wonderful Union regiments that also helped to hold Little Round Top. Um, I will leave it there. I know I am now the most hated man on this stream. Um, so <laughs> We're going to lose about, some uh, viewers now, Jake. I mean, <laughs> that's okay. I Sophie, Sophie will get them back. Yes. I can say something positive about Phil Sheridan if you want to lose that title, but let's focus on Sophie. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I, I kind of want to hear something uh, about little Phil. I'm not paying attention to you. <laughs> hmm? So Sophie lost interest in you, Jake. Yeah, I know. Yeah. She's, we, we put her to sleep. Big, big Chamberlain fan. Big Chamberlain fan. <laughs> All right, so let's uh, let's jump over to uh, Kendrick. How about uh, how about you give us what you got? All right, so um, I think this pairs nicely with what Rich talked about because um, when he started his uh, little spiel, he was talking about um, a little engagement on the morning of April 9th, 
um, where the cavalry was involved and then they ran into a line of infantry. Well, that I'm going to be talking about the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry um, who was involved in that. Um, and more specifically talking about a gentleman named uh, Samuel Levis Gracie. Um, and he was the chaplain for the regiment. And I will also be mentioning, um, uh, or I will be putting his picture in the comments later on. So I'm using uh, my, my iPhone as my uh, camera, so I can't screen share because um, I'm using my laptop for all my other notes. Um, but Samuel, Grevis Le or, yeah, Samuel Levis Gracie um, was born in 1835. He's from Philadelphia. Um, and uh, he was educated at Boston University and became an ordained minister in 1857. Um, he went back to Philadelphia and served as a minister and then was, uh, became a, uh, was uh, appointed chaplain of the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry in 1861. And he held that post until 1864. Um, he became chaplain of the 1st Division of the Cavalry Corps Army of the Potomac, which he will be holding at the time of um, uh, the surrender at Appomattox. But before that happens, he served briefly actually as uh, the chaplain of a large prisoner of war camp at Rock Island, Illinois, um, before he rejoined the regiment right, at, right before um, uh, the surrender. Um, he spends a lot of time in uh, the Methodist Episcopalian Church um, in Wilmington, uh, Delaware, uh, Philadelphia, uh, Boston, and also had dabbles in politics and becomes a consul in, um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, into their Fuchou or Fuchou, China um, in the 1890s. And um, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Gracie uh, has a very grim end to his life. Um, he's buried at Mount Moriah Cemetery in Philadelphia, and he dies in Boston in 1911. But um, according to um, the Middleborough Gazette, um, it's mentioned that he uh, potentially committed suicide by hanging um, at, in, in 1911, and uh, he was uh, 75 years old at the time. But anyway, uh, Mr. Gracie uh, also wrote the unit history for the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry. It's called the Annals of the 6th Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I wanted to read to you uh, a portion of it from April 9th, um, because since he was on division staff um, and, and corps staff for um, the cavalry, he got pretty close uh, with Sheridan to uh, the uh, surrender. And what he, what he does get a recollection of the surrender from a, uh, an aide to Sheridan that was pretty close by. Um, and I will read a little bit of that to you. He says, the town consists of about five houses, a tavern and a courthouse, all on one street. And that was boarded up at one end to keep the cows out. So it is a very small um, farm town. Um, I will mention, I might have a struggle reading this. Uh, Mr. Gracie uses the long S, if anybody's familiar with what that is in the, um, in the uh, kind of old English text, more like 18th century, 19th century English text, uh, long S looks like an F. So I, I, it'll kind of uh, mess me up a little bit. Um, on the right hand side, we went in was a principal residence owned by Mr. McLean. Uh, that's where the, the uh, surrender takes place. And, and to his house, General Grant was conducted uh, to meet General Lee. At the at the fence, the whole party dismounted, walking over a narrow, narrow grass plot to the house. Uh, Notice General Lee's gray horse nibbling there in charge of an orderly who was holding his own as well. General Grant entered the house with one or two of his staff and the rest of us sat down on the piazza and waited. Mr. McLean was out there too, but was so much excited by his appreciation of passing events that he did not know where his pump was or if he had, if he had any, meaning water. And he could not tell us where was a spring. In a moment, Colonel Babcock came out smiling, whirled his hat round his head and one, and once and beckoned Generals Ord and Sheridan to come in. They walked the floor silently and pe as people do who have first peep at a baby. And after a while, General Lee came out and signaled to his orderly to bridle his horse. While this was being done, he stood on the lowest step of the piazza. We had all risen respectfully as he passed down and looking over into the valley toward his army, smote his hands together several times in an absent 
sort of way and utterly unconscious of the people about him and seeming to see nothing till his horse was led in front of him. As he stood there, he appeared to be about 60 years of age, a tall soldierly figure of a man with a full gray beard, a new suit of gray clothes, a high gray felt hat with a cord, long buckskin gauntlets, riding, high riding boots, and a beautiful sword. He was all that our fancy had painted him, and he had the sympathy of us all as he rode away. Just as he gathered up his bridle, General Grant went down the steps and passing in front of his horse, touched it to his hat, or touched his hat to General Lee, who made a similar salute, and then left the yard and returned to his own lines with his orderly and the single staff officer who had accompanied him to the interview and who was said to have been Colonel Marshall, his chief of staff, a quiet looking man in spectacles, more like one of thought than of action. General Grant presented something of a contract to General Lee in the way of uniform, not only in color, but in style and general effect. He had on a sugar loaf hat, almost peculiar to himself, a frock coat unbuttoned and, and splashed with mud, a dark vest, dark blue pantaloons tucked into top boots, muddy also and no sword. His countenance was not relaxed at all and not a muscle of his face could told tales on his thoughts. If he was very much pleased by the surrender of Lee, nothing in his air or manner ind indicated. The joyful occasion did not seem to awaken him and a, re and a responsive echo and he went and dismounted his horse and rode away silently to fend off the dispatch which should electrify the North and set all the church bells ringing jubilant vespers on this happy Sunday evening. Uh, I think that is just a great uh, description, very detailed description of um, what occurred um, on uh, April the 9th. Um, now, obviously, those are not Mr. Gracie's words, but he was given those words um, and probably interviewed this gentleman that spoke um, at the, um, at the, uh, uh, was, was present close to, at least close to the, uh, the front steps of the McLean house. Um, I think what's what's kind of what's kind of cool is, it, and I want to give this a personal aspect here to Mr. Gra Mr. Gracie. Um, he writes just before that, um, and this kind of gives his personal account of what his feelings were at that time. He says, "Night found us on the road to Appomattox Courthouse, toward which toward which place a demoralized remnant from the station had flown, and we lay down here for our last sleep in the lap of actual war." For Though we hardly hoped for such good fortune then, the morning would see us tossed suddenly into the arms of peace. Um, so very uh, fine way with words Mr. Gracie had. And uh, uh, I actually, actually would like to check out more of this, uh, this unit history because um, it seems like he is a great writer. Well, thank you for that, Kendrick. And I'll let you know that uh, Facebook loves your dog. So cheers oh, to good. Sophie. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Cody, what you got for us? Sure. So I'm going to move 250 miles north of the events that we're talking about and go to a site that had relevance earlier in the war. And when we're talking about Pennsylvania, of course, no town is harder hit by this conflict than is Gettysburg. And just like last week, where I kind of gauged the reactions of the town in the press and in public with regard to the fall of Richmond and the, the evacuation of the Confederate capital, I wanted to look at what were the reactions in the town to Appomattox. And what we sort of see is this interesting dueling contrasts once more, once more uh, between kind of the partisan press of the town. And this sort of serves as a microcosm for what was happening all across the North, not only during election season, but especially now that the war is coming to a culmination. And now that it is very clear that there are going to be political consequences of the war itself. So on one hand, you have the Democratic compiler, a very conservative view of the conflict, wants to see the war end at really any, any uh, means possible, wants to bring about peace. And above all else, that's the term that you see time and time again is peace. Whereas on the Republican side, the, uh, the Sentinel, a more progressive paper, is looking more at victory. So this idea dueling of peace versus victory, which is more important, and that plays out in their Appomattox coverage. Now there's another interesting aspect to this and that is in terms of timing. If you were a reader of the Democratic compiler, you would not have read as much about Lee's surrender for this simple fact. They published on Mondays, the surrender took place on a Sunday. All that the newspaper on April 10th, 1865 will say for the compiler is a couple little lines. 
Lee surrendered Monday morning. A dispatch has just been received from Baltimore stating that Lee surrendered to Grant yesterday. Lee's army to be paroled and go home until properly exchanged. Whereas if you consider maybe in the next week's paper for the following Monday, April 17th, they're going to cover the uh, Appomattox surrender in more detail. What happens in between then? The assassination and death of Abraham Lincoln. And so they'll open a portion of their April 17th paper by saying, our readers will, we know, excuse the late appearance of the compiler this morning when we tell them that it, it is caused by our desire to give them the particulars of the assassination of President Lincoln in this issue. And so it's interesting because the conservative press in Gettysburg, if that was your paper of choice, you probably were not as understanding or familiar with the particulars of, uh, of what had happened at Appomattox. Nevertheless, what does the compiler say about it? Again, we go to that idea that they're looking at peace above all else. Surrender of Lee and his whole army to Grant, a great and bloodless victory. May it bring true peace and union. They talk about the magnanimous terms that Grant had, had offered to Lee. The terms offered by General Grant and accepted in good faith by General Lee are honorable, such as will be recognized as fitting, proper, and in complete accordance with all the usages of civilized warfare. He does not seek to degrade or even to humiliate a conquered enemy. Another piece was called The Hour of Victory, in which, similar to what I shared last week about questioning what will be the political ramifications of, of Union victory, let them up easy is basically what the compiler wants to do. They say that the demonstrations of gladness with which Lee's surrender were, was received all over the North indicate more clearly than words how the masses of people yearn for the end of this bloody and desolating struggle. God grant that peace and prosperity may soon follow these heroic achievements. Uh, they then ask the question, it now remains for the powers at Washington to exercise statesmanship in finishing up the work required to save the Union and put the nation again on the high road to prosperity. Will they do it? If ever there is a period more than any other requiring wisdom in all the virtues, it is the hour of victory. Let therefore all good men, while rejoicing in the glad tidings of Lee's surrender, pray that true statesmanship may govern in the executive councils. The only other thing that they really address in terms of the surrender is they sprinkle throughout the issue, and this is a common compiler uh, tactic if you read a lot of issues of it, is they put in these opinion pieces about race. And this was by any definition then or now, the term white supremacy uh, is at play here. And in the aftermath of the Civil War in particular, it becomes especially prevalent with regard to, uh, to Reconstruction. Um, the only real incendiary piece that they have here is right between an article about the assassination and an article about uh, about the surrender. Uh, they reprint a piece from a newspaper called The Age, which had in turn responded to a New York Tribune editorial. This gives you a sense of where the, the Democratic press in Gettysburg is at that moment. This piece said, in the aftermath of this surrender, we do most earnestly protest against the gatherings of Negroes. It has pleased God to make the lab to make labor the fundamental law of human existence. We know that many blacks are poorly fitted for freedom. And so that is one section of Gettysburg's reaction is reprinting those pieces and looking not at any sort of political ramifications of this war, but simply being relieved that peace has been achieved. Now on the Republican side, the Adam Sentinel is looking at it quite differently. On April 11th, their papers are printed on Tuesdays. They said the war nearly over. The news we give today is of the most cheering kind. They reprint some of the dispatches from Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War. Uh, the correspondence that had been, been publicized between Lee and Grant is there as well. And then they say, this we think is the beginning of the end of the unholy rebellion. So different language, of course, being used here. And we congratulate our readers on the glorious intelligence. I think that's an interesting line. They're congratulating their readership. The people of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, who had in many ways endured a piece of this conflict, it seems as though they're kind of giving that idea to the public that this is your victory just as it is as much as it is for the nation or the soldiers on the battlefield. They continued, it is a matter for general rejoicing and a thanks to God for his goodness to us in thus putting an end to this cruel war and ordering victory to perch upon our banners and bringing back our great nation to peace with the prospect of a more glorious name in the future than it has had in the past. They then talk about some of the events that had taken place in Gettysburg, the celebrations physically in the streets. 
Upon receiving the glorious news of the surrender of Lee and his army, yesterday morning the pupils of the public schools of the borough were assembled on the upper floor of a school building after being led by the principal of the high school in a prayer of thanksgiving to the King of Kings. For his gracious interposition in our behalf as a nation, they united in singing the Star-Spangled Banner, My Country Tis of Thee, and the Old Hunter Doxology. Cheer after cheer was then vigorously given for our victorious generals, our government, the old flag, etc. After these exercises, the schools were dismissed for the day. The stores were also closed in the afternoon, and a general jollification took place at night among the young Americans as usual. They then talk about what had happened in the week prior to that. The news of the evacuation of Richmond combined with the news of this surrender, and they called this a week uh, a week that was a time of general rejoicing all over the country and the speedy crushing of rebellion that is now inevitable. In all cities and towns of the land, it has been a jubilee of the most enthusiastic character. They talk about there being a bonfire in the square. For those who, who listened last week, there was the uh, kind of a uh, funny typo of a bone fire being lit in the aftermath of, uh, of Richmond. They get it right here. A bonfire is lit in the square. It was kept up all night, which added to the general enthusiasm. And in the course of the evening, the people assembled and were addressed by the Honorable Edward McPherson, famous abolitionist Republican congressman, uh, whose farm on McPherson's Ridge is, is a major site of the first day's battle of Gettysburg. He delivered a speech from the steps of the courthouse in his usual energetic and masterly uh, manner during which he was loudly applauded. Enthusiastic cheers were given at the close for Grant, Sheridan, Sherman, and the whole army of the Union, etc., and for General Rejoicing, who was now the greatest general in the world. They kept up the performance in various ways of their choosing during the greater part of the night. And there's another piece that mentions that Governor Andrew Curtin had issued a proclamation that, uh, that there would be specific church services uh, observed as a day of thanksgiving and praise in the aftermath of this news. And they say, we believe it was complied with in the churches of this borough. Um, the, the last sort of piece that I want to mention here is how Gettysburg will continue to use Appomattox as a kind of a touchstone in its interpretation of events for years to come. And specifically, we can look at Ulysses S. Grant, who comes to Gettysburg in June of 1867. He's hailed as the great captain of the age, is, is what the newspaper says, a popular term for him at that moment. And it's not long after he visits Gettysburg that this hype kind of picks up for him to run for president in 1868. And of course, he ultimately is victorious. And in the now titled Star and Sentinel, the, the two Republican papers had merged in the aftermath uh, of the Civil War. Um, on November 6, 1868, when the Star and Sentinel is announcing Grant's victory, they hail it as, quote, victory, the second rebellion closed, a second Appomattox, surrender of the rebel army north and south, glorious popular triumph. The great presidential struggle has ended in a glorious triumph of Republican principles and a complete crushing out of the new rebellion. Treason has met its second Appomattox. And so this is a theme that will play pretty commonly throughout the remainder of Gettysburg's interpretation of the Civil War uh, and its legacy. Um, I, I just touch briefly on this here. The, I'll probably do more for, for the Penn Civil War blog. But in 1885, there's an interesting story about a man named Benjamin Jeffries, who by then was a resident of Des Moines, Iowa. But he had been a, re, a veteran of Company A of the 191st Pennsylvania, which was president at Appomattox. And he gives this little story in which he talks about seeing what he called the first meeting between Grant and Lee. But it seems as though he's confusing it with what is actually the second meeting between the two of them on April 10th, 1865, when they're kind of uh, meeting once more the day after the, the formal surrender. But he makes this line, Grant offered his hand to Lee and they shook hands as did their aides and all engaged in conversation for about five minutes. I saw the first meeting between Grant and Lee and I saw Grant refuse to take Lee's sword for I stood less than 100 yards away at that time. I have as, as vivid a recollection of that scene as if it had been taken yesterday. Uh, this is a, a, a piece, if anybody's read Grant, Grant's memoirs, he writes in there, the much talked of surrendering of Lee's sword and my handing it back, this and much more that has been said about it is of purest romance. And so it's interesting that even the Gettysburg newspaper is publishing an account from a man who says that he has this vivid recollection of something that, according to Grant and pretty much any other account didn't actually happen. 
Well, I'm always uh, I'm always just moved by your uh, your selections from those Gettysburg newspapers. Uh, you know, lots of eloquence on display there, and uh, for for both sides of the issue, um, for better or for worse, uh, in those newspapers. Um, so I'm going to jump in on this next one here and uh, and kind of go back 250 miles further south, uh, back to Appomattox itself. And I wanna talk about um, this gentleman here who I have long um, been fascinated with his story. Um, and that would be, be this gentleman here and his wife. Um, so this is uh, Sergeant Henry Kaiser um, and his wife, uh, Sarah, a workman or Sally uh, is what uh, she 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 goes by. Um, Henry Kaiser uh, is uh, grew up, uh, spent most of his life in the community of Lycans, Pennsylvania. It's in northern Dauphin County. Uh, he uh, is one of those soldiers, and and I'll I'll touch briefly on his career as as a soldier in the Union Army. Uh, he is one of those soldiers that signs up in the wake of Fort Sumter. Um, in the week after the bombardment of Fort Sumter, and he serves out uh, until uh, Appomattox and then the aftermath. He doesn't get out of the uh, muster out of the Union Army until July of 1865. Um, he's wounded once during the war. Um, he shot at Cedar Creek, um, luckily not a direct hit. Um, he shot uh, bullet careens into his uh, cartridge box, uh, which uh, leaves a nasty bruise on his hip, leaves him unable to walk. Um, he was taken to a field hospital, kind of looked after, and, and shortly after the Battle of Cedar Creek rejoined his unit. Um, he served with uh, initially with the 10th Pennsylvania uh, Infantry um, for three months in the, the first summer of the war, and then joined the 96th Pennsylvania Company G um, until 1864, uh, when that unit, uh, he, he re-enlisted, got a nice hefty bounty uh, for re-enlisting. Uh, and because of the number numbers of in the unit, both because of lack of re-enlistment in the 96th Pennsylvania, uh, and also because of casualties during the uh, the summer of 1864, uh, that unit ceased to exist in September of 1864, and and Henry Kaiser was transferred to Company G of the neighboring 95th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry, which is where he's going to serve out the rest of the war. Um, which is also where he's going to be, who he's going to be serving with when he uh, is at Appomattox or in the vicinity of Appomattox on April 9th of 1865. Now, what I find remarkable about, about uh, Sergeant Kaiser here is that he is one of those soldiers who keeps a diary for darn near every day that he served uh, in the war. Um, his diary was widely distributed. You can find copies in uh, several historical repositories, including the uh, um, at the United States Army uh, Education and Heritage Center in Carlisle um, and local historical societies in Dauphin County. Um, he made seven copies of his wartime diary for each of his children uh, in 1911-1912, uh, hand wrote um, they were 300 pages long. He made seven copies. Um, it's uh, I, I'm just stunned by uh, his ability to do that. I do think that it may have helped him deal with some of the uh, sites and deal with some of the, the aftermath of and emotional experiences that he had during the war. There's some very uh, violent scenes that he relates, especially from the Overland campaign, especially uh, at Spotsylvania Courthouse on both May 10th and May 12th, 1864, that seemed to stuck with him for the rest of his life. He wrote about them later. Um, but his... Uh, April 9th, 1865 diary entry, I think is, is, is pretty moving. I think one of the more moving entries in his wartime diary. Um, he wrote um, several times that day in his diary, wrote an initial morning entry, um, kind of giving a, a description of, of what the unit was doing. The unit had been heavily engaged at Sailor's Creek. Uh, the 95th Pennsylvania was with um, Horatio Wright's Sixth Corps, um, and so they're they're going to be heavily engaged at Sailor's Creek, um, and they can hear the firing of the guns, the Battle of Appomattox, but they're not going to be actually involved in that on April 9th. They're going to be several miles away, sipping on some coffee, listening to the battle in the distance, getting ready, making sure if they are called into action that they're prepared. Um, but in the later in the morning, they um, start to march, and then they hear it rumored that that Robert E. Lee had surrendered his army. Uh, Kaiser refers to that news as uh, 
it seems too good to be true. So this man who has been at war for four years now, uh, almost four years, just shy of four years, um, doesn't necessarily believe uh, this news that, that he's hearing from just up the road at Appomattox Courthouse. At uh, 2.30, that unit was stopped on their march, um, ordered to, to encamp, um, and he notes that it's good probability that he has had his last fight. Uh, 4.30 this afternoon, an officer on horseback, waving his hat and horse running as if his life depended on its speed, came tearing from the front, yelling the glorious news that General Lee had surrendered the entire Army of Northern Virginia to General Grant. Such cheering shouting and rejoicing as there was throughout the whole army of the Potomac was never seen or heard in America. The air was literally filled with knapsacks, haversacks, canteens, and everything else the boys could throw into the air. Most of the batteries fired a salute of 30 guns in honor of the glorious victory. Some cried for joy. The rebel army has stacked arms about two miles from here at Appomattox Courthouse. We marched 10 miles today. And this is where I, I imagine uh, Henry Kaiser just putting on his sunglasses and saying, he finishes this diary entry with, the day was fine. Um, I, I just love this entry uh, from, from Kaiser. Uh, you know, he's, he's a soldier who sees uh, brutal action during the war again, especially because uh, he's with the Sixth Corps, especially in 1864. Um, he sees some of the worst uh, at the wilderness, at Spotsylvania Courthouse, Cold Harbor, at Petersburg, and then ultimately in the Shenandoah Valley um, at, at Third Winchester, and especially at Cedar Creek where he was wounded. Uh, goes on to live a long life, one of the last veterans uh, alive, um, passes away in 1932 or 1933, 1932 or 1933 uh, in his hometown in Likens. He was one of the last living veterans um, of the Civil War uh, there. Um, and I think, uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a moving uh, entry about what Appomattox meant to one soldier, but also what Appomattox meant to uh, all of those serving in the Union Army at that time. Hey, Jake. Yeah. So earlier we had a question about the stripe that's on Kaiser's sleeve. Yes. And I might have missed this, but did did he re-enlist in '64? Yes, he re-enlisted. Okay, so that I believe that's like a a, a veteran's like a uh, it's a, a veteran stripe for re-enlistment after his term was over, I guess. Let me let me go back to that just so we can see. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not much of a you know into the material culture. I will admit, so I, I am oftentimes uh, pretty, uh, you know, um, out of my depth when it comes to these things. So um, I appreciate your your knowledge there, Rich. So um, are you notice is that on the lower sleeve? It's yeah, it's on the lower sleeve, right above the cuff. You can see there's like a thick stripe going across there. Mm -hmm. um, typically, I mean, there's guys who get it in the the regular U.S. infantry, but also in volunteer regiments. Uh, I believe if, if guys re-enlisted after their initial three-year enlistment, uh, they could get that stripe. And so you see a lot of guys toward, you know, mid, late 1864 walking out with those. Okay. I mean, that or makes sense. 65. You see, um, you see that, that unit get, um, you know, re renamed um, from the 95th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry to the United, 95th uh, Pennsylvania Veteran uh, volunteer infantry. So I guess is that kind of affiliated maybe with yeah, that strike? The veteran volunteer infantry regiment. That's usually okay. yeah. Excellent. So um, let's uh, let's move on. We've we've gone now for a little over an hour. So I think it's about time to to start wrapping up. So um, at the end of these kind of um, these streams that we've been doing, this is our second one. We tend to do uh, quite a few more of these for the length of the uh, of the coronavirus shutdown. Um, but uh, we like to do a final word, so just kind of a brief um, emphasis on on brief um, little entries for each of us to kind of go around and and give our audience um, who have been uh, steadfast with us tonight. Thank you all so much for watching. Um, but uh, to give our audience kind of uh, something to leave this stream with, something to remember, a factoid, a quote, um, you know, what something you want them to, to remember. So Beth, since you're our, our guest tonight, I thought we could start with you. Yeah, so uh, I heard you mention this earlier and I got really excited. This is like one of my favorite things to do. So I dug up a quote um, while y'all were talking that, so for me, I, 
part of what I find interesting about Appomattox is the campaign, the surrender, the details of how these armies interact with each other and the bureaucracy. But what I really find compelling is what happens afterward. Um, there's a lot of focus, I think, on um, the generals, on their exchanges, on the civility that they show, the kind of peaceful disbanding of Lee's army. Um, but I think it's really important to take a look back at Appomattox. So I, I wanted to read this report um, from May 5th, 1868, the Freedmen's Bureau, Richmond, Virginia office. The report of Charles W. McMahon, Freedmen's school teacher at Appomattox Courthouse in reference to acts of violence committed by the Ku Klux Klan in reply that you will instruct the freedmen to prepare themselves for their own protection against these lawless acts, and if molested by these or any other bands in the manner related, to defend themselves like free men, and the law and power of this government will sustain them in thus defending their lives and liberties. So just a glimpse of what's happening in Appomattox a few years later. It's not all um, sunshine and roses. It's also the Klan. Wow, that is, uh, that is quite the quote. I didn't yeah. mean to be depressing to leave. No, I mean it's uh, it's it's, uh, <laughs> it's the reality. History, history, oftentimes is uh, yeah, it's not all sun, sunshine and butterflies. All right, so who wants to uh, who wants to take up the next one? Any takers, volunteers? I'll do it. Kendrick's got it. All right, so first I just want to uh, I forgot to do this shout out earlier um, to my. Uh, college roommate of all four years, uh, Nate Heilman, um, who before my fiance had to listen to my history ramblings in our dorm room for four years. So um, I know he watched last week. I don't know if he tuned in or not this week. But um, for my final word, I just want to go back to um, some of uh, the writings of, of Mr. Gracie, um, just some uh, two little snippets here. Um, right. Uh, so the Sixth Pennsylvania Cavalry was involved in the Grand Review in Washington and he wrote this great way to end um, his military career. He said, here as the 6th Pennsylvania Cavalry turned out of Pennsylvania Avenue, where the great throng had greeted us with such a splendid outburst of applause, it may be said that our glorious old regiment ended its career, that with the cheers of the crowd still ringing about us, we furled up the tattered colors which had streamed up over us for so long. And then, um, he finishes out the conclusion of the book by saying, but there are so many who started with us and many who joined us later who have fallen by the way. Let us give our last thought to the memory of these as we bid farewell to the gallant old regiment and put away the torn standard at the trusty and the trusty arms. So I, th I think that's a, just a, a very fitting ending to not only our, our live stream, but also we're talking about the end of the American Civil War um, and a lot of these guys who like uh, um, Mr. Kaiser, um, spent his entire, you know, four years of, uh, of his life in a blue uniform. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, and they're the reason why we do things like this. Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks for that, Kendrick. Mm -hmm. Rich, Cody, who wants to take next? I'm trying to find something. So could you take it, Cody? Yep, I'll be happy to, <laughs> yep. So I'm gonna I'm going to share two uh, two brief reflections here. One from a Pennsylvanian, one one not, but I think it's still fitting. Uh, the one from a Pennsylvanian is Colonel L. D. Bumpus. It's a good name of yes. the 57th Pennsylvania Infantry, and this was at their uh, monumental dedication at Gettysburg on July 2nd, 1888. So the 25th anniversary of the battle. As he's winding toward his conclusion, he basically makes the case that Pennsylvanians were there through it all, from Fort Sumter uh, up until Appomattox. And he says that um, we were at Appomattox when traitors fired their last volley and in all those terrible intermediate struggles in every rebellious state and every important battle on land or water where treason was to be confronted or rebellion subdued, the soldiers and sailors of Pennsylvania were ever found confronting the one and conquering the other. So that's one Pennsylvanian's thought on the fact that they're there through everything, including uh, up to Appomattox. Um, my final word then would come not from a man directly dealing with Pennsylvania, although he had he had certainly recruited in the state uh, during the course of the conflict. I'll return to the man I return to so often, and that's Frederick Douglass. Um, he is delivering a speech at um, this is in at the Rochester, New York City Hall, April fifteenth, eighteen sixty five, in light 
of of the surrender as well as of course by that time the assassination of lincoln so there's a little bit of that that bleeds through but he he talks about this idea of how we remember this and he says we were manifesting the other day almost as much gratitude to general lee for surrendering as to general grant for compelling him to surrender it seemed to me that general lee was the most popular man in america and that's met with applause laughter and cheers according to the press account but then he leaves us with a, an interesting sign off he says, but republics have proverbially short memories. Let us not be in too much haste in the work of restoration. Know no man hereafter in all these states by his complexion, but know every man by his loyalty. And wherever there is a patriot in the north or south, white or black, helping in the good cause, hail him as a citizen, a kinsman, a clansman, a brother beloved. Let us not remember our enemies and disfran disenfranchise our friends. For the safety of all, let justice be done to each. Drop the mic. <laughs> <laughs> As Frederick Douglass so often does. Yes. That's uh, great, Cody. Thanks for that. Uh, Rich, you got All anything? Right, so I was not able to find what I was looking to find, uh, but uh, I'll leave you with a little bit, uh, a tidbit here. Um, for anyone that is interested in the 155th Pennsylvania, which I talked about earlier, uh, one of my favorite regiments, um, you can check out, it's a book called Under the Maltese Cross. It's the uh, 155th Regimental History. It's available online uh, in its entirety. It's completely digitized. Um, and for anyone who ever gets a chance to visit the Pittsburgh area, if you go to Soldiers and Sailors uh, Memorial Hall and Museum, if you've never been, it's an amazing collection. Obviously, they're not open right now. Um, but when they are, they do have a full 155th Zouave uniform completely intact, belonged to a guy named Noah Pangburn, who actually was also uh, at Appomattox as well. Um, so if you ever get a chance, like I said, you come to Pittsburgh, uh, you'll learn a little bit more about the 155th Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'll just leave you with uh, wash your hands, use some hand sanitizer, get those masks, and we can all be out on the battlefield much faster. Thank you. Again, here, here, another another mic drop. Uh, thanks, Rich. Um, you can steal that. Uh, you can steal that Fez from there. Um, <laughs> don't 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 tell him I said that. Uh, invited you to do that. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm gonna close out here with with my final word. Um, last week I talked about uh, my passion for uh, terrible wartime poetry that appeared in newspapers. Um, last year, we, we definitely learned over and over again that Richmond had fallen. Um, and so I have this week uh, two selections for you. Uh, one is very short, I promise. The other is a little longer, but not too long. Um, that was also published like last week's selection uh, in the April 1865 editions of the Miners Journal of Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Um, and this one was published on April 15th, 1865 uh, by a Mr. T.J. O'Brien. Uh, and the poem is called, Let the Glad Notes of Victory. That's the title. Um, and it was apparently meant to accompany an Irish folk tune, fight folk tune, which was called Thy Fair Bosom, um, which I found about 20 seconds of and tried to match up the words and couldn't do it. So I won't sing for you tonight, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, Beth, Beth looks uh, distraught. I'm distraught. I, I was really hoping, I mean, we just passed St. <laughs> Patrick's Day, like that would be perfect. Jake, you're letting us all down. I'm sorry. Well, I, I hope that the, the words of Mr. TJ O'Brien will, will make it up to you because this poem is, I, I don't want to say it's totally dreadful, but it's it's pretty dreadful. So again, let the glad notes of victory. Here we go. The rhymes in here are a big stretch. Let the glad notes of victory resound from Oregon to Maine. Strike, strike the harp from sea to sea for freedom's sun shines forth again. <laughs> let the trumpets ring and cannons roar, unfurl our banners to the air and raise to God on high once more, all hearts in earnest, grateful prayer. For our defenders once again have triumphed o'er their rebel foes, and the great Hydra girl with pain is gasping mid its dying throes. The boasted strategic key to Richmond walls impregnable before the ingenuity and valor 
of Columbia fell. And now her prided warlike host is broken, scattered in despair. At last they see their, co their cause is lost. Their scheme ending in empty air. Soon, very soon the strife will cease and they will for forgiveness sue. Then welcome to the paths of peace, defenders of the union true. So let the notes of victory resound from Oregon to Maine. Strike, strike the harp from sea to sea for freedom's sun shines forth again. Let trumpets ring and cannons roar, unfurl our banners in the high, in the air, and raise to God on high once more, all hearts in earnest, grateful prayer. So that rhymes so terrible, it's worth repeating twice. Uh, I have one more, uh, one more final word. Um, this is truly the final word, and um, as this is appropriate for 2020, I thought it should come in tweet form. So I bring you some uh, words of poetry from Twitter um, that I will bring up right now, I hope. There we go. Here it is right now. So I give you some poetry about Appomattox. Grant wore those Appomattox jeans, the boots with the spurs, the room cheered when he and Lee concurred. And that is my final word, a wonderful tweet, a terrible joke. Uh, and uh, I think that's a pretty good place to leave it tonight. So what do you guys think? You could have sang that one. We know how that one goes. Yeah, you could, you could yeah <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Beth. I'm sorry that I didn't sing again. tonight. Yeah, it's. I felt like it was more powerful to just speak those those incredible incredible lines. Um, can I can I, uh, can I just say one thing very briefly here? Another one anniversary today that's Pennsylvania related. Uh, 155th anniversary as well of the date of the last general dying during the war, and that was Thomas Smith who was an Irish immigrant. I just remember this when you mentioned uh, the, the Irish tune there. Um, but he had spent a few years before the Civil War in Philadelphia. He moves to Delaware, but he is mortally wounded on April 7th near Farmville. And then he dies today, 155 years ago. So one final little Pennsylvania connection to Appomattox there. I, I would say that that's the final word, but thankfully our wonderful audience has completed the next line. <laughs> Thank you, Colin. The <laughs> verse, uh, which would be flags hit the floor, Confederate flag got low, low, low. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you, you don't, you don't, you don't get rhymes like this anywhere else, people. This is Pencil uh -huh. War, and this is what we're all about. Yeah. So thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. I really appreciate uh, this, you know, coming, tuning in. Um, I think I speak for the other contributors here that, that we all, you know, are so thankful that, that we have these opportunities to share public history. Um, thank you all so much for, for tuning in. Um, thank you to my fellow contributors to Penn Civil War and a very special thank you to Beth Parnitza from Appomattox. You are wonderful. Um, and thank you so much for, for dealing with us tonight um, and taking time out of your, I would say busy schedule, but none of us have busy schedules anymore. Um, but thank you so much for, for sticking with us tonight and, and giving us some great context for, for all things Appomattox. Thanks, both. Well, thanks. Thank yeah. you. I did it for Sophie, but thanks, uh, thanks guys. <laughs> Sophie, Sophie looks really appreciative. Sophie. Hi, Sophie. Oh, she doesn't care anymore. Oh. <laughs> 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 all right it's a good place to leave it thank you all so much for watching and i hope you have a wonderful night and a great weekend thanks you all so much stay safe